Thank you. Welcome, everybody. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob. I'm with the University of Kentucky, and I am the coordinator for the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice. We try to have a uh, webinar once a month, and this month we're looking at animal welfare. Uh, Dr. Marissa Erasmus is going to be giving the presentation. She received her BS in animal biology from the University of Guelph in Canada. As an undergraduate, she worked at a turkey breeder farm in Ontario where she developed her interests in poultry behavior and well-being. She's conducted a wide variety of research projects related to poultry behavior and welfare. The research that Marissa completed as part of her master's at the University of Guelph evaluated humane on-farm euthanasia methods for turkeys. In 2014, she completed her PhD in animal science at Michigan State University. Her PhD dissertation uh, research focused on relationships between genetics, temperament, and feather pecking, as well as meat quality of turkeys. Upon completing her PhD, she continued working at Michigan State University as a research assistant, examining the relationships between brain activity and behavior of turkeys. And in 2015, Dr. Erasmus joined Purdue University as an assistant professor. Her extension and applied research activities focus on generating science-based methods for objectively evaluating animal welfare and understanding how management and environmental factors influence animal behavior and welfare. Her lab is currently conducting research that is examining the preference of laying hens for particular nesting materials in a cage-free housing system. She's also conducting research aimed at understanding behavioral indica indicators of stress and disease in turkeys. As part of her extension programs, Marissa develops and provides training in animal welfare. She will be talking today on uh, animal welfare and, and small and backyard flocks. All yours, Marissa. Great. Right. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So hopefully everyone can see it. Um, so I'm just going to start with a, a brief background about our three major poultry species and some history about uh, these animals, and then talk a bit about what animal welfare actually is, and then go into some of the most common animal welfare considerations for our backyard poultry flocks. So the wild ancestor of the domestic chicken is the red jungle fowl, and so our chickens have been domesticated for, uh, were domesticated over 8,000 years ago. And from this red jungle fowl, we have two major lines, genetic lines of chickens, so our egg laying lines and our meat lines, and they're very, very efficient at producing either eggs or meat. So if you look at this picture of the broiler chicken down here, this is a 1957 bird, and it's five times smaller than today's broiler chicken at the same age. So it's really amazing what we've been able to do in 60 years or so just by breeding these birds for a particular purpose. For our turkeys, the wild ancestor is the wild turkey. They're native to North America. They were domesticated about 2,000 years ago in Mexico. And then in the 1960s is when breeding really started uh, targeting white feathering and these large breast muscles. So the commercial turkeys that we get at Thanksgiving, uh, the broad breasted white turkeys, cannot mate naturally. This is not the case for our heritage turkey breeds, which are popular for backyard flocks. And so they're a little bit different, but even though these birds are very different from their wild ancestors, they still have a lot of the same behaviors that the wild ancestors have. For our ducks, the domestic Pekin duck was domesticated from the wild mallard, also about 2000 years ago. And um, so what we have is a lot of different chicken breeds and many different breeds of turkeys as well, not as many as chickens, of course, um, but people have backyard birds for a variety of different reasons. The most common reasons are to produce either eggs or meat. Um, some people have them because they enjoy looking at their behavior or they want the poultry to have some kind of role in gardening, helping with gardening. So eating bugs and pests and things like that. And then of course there are those people 
who have poultry maybe because they want to be famous. So if you have backyard poultry, maybe your calling is to produce some kind of a YouTube video like this one about the Brahma chicken. I'm sure you've all seen it, but when this video first came out, people could not believe that this was actually a real chicken. Um, so there are many, many different breeds of poultry and people have many different interests in showing these birds. But along with this interest in backyard poultry keeping, we've seen a huge interest in recent years in so urban farming and also the local food movement. So a lot of restaurants are providing food that's been locally sourced. And so together with this change in attitude about keeping poultry and keeping farm animals in our backyard, people's attitudes about animal welfare have also changed quite a lot in recent years. We've seen a lot more stores opening up, niche market stores that produce welfare-friendly foods or food that's promoted as being welfare-friendly. But together with that, there's also a lot more information about animal welfare available. We've seen a lot more undercover videos popping up. Uh, most recently in the news, um, the USDA has been knocked for blacking out some information pertaining to animal welfare. But in addition to all of these different animal welfare information sources and increased interest in animal welfare, there have also been legislative changes when it comes to animal welfare. A good example is California in 2008 with Proposition 2, and then most recently in Massachusetts, where people voted to support um, the changes in housing systems for uh, egg-laying hens, veal calves, and gestating sows. So these changes in legislation have had a huge impact on the commercial egg industry. So where our laying hens have traditionally been housed in conventional cages, the industry is now looking more toward alternative systems such as aviaries or keeping birds on the floor. And the reason for this is because in these conventional cages, the birds don't have access to perches, nesting areas, or scratching areas. And I'll talk more about this behavior later on in terms of backyard flocks as well. But these birds are very motivated to perform this behavior. And so some companies such as McDonald's have said that they're only going to sell eggs from cage-free housing systems. So there's been a huge movement on the animal welfare front with people's attitudes changing, with legislative changes. And so you can see how animal welfare really is a huge topic now. It's a hot topic. Um, it can be a polarizing issue because people have different opinions when it comes to animal welfare. And part of the reason for this is because ethics are involved. And so people have different ethical views when it comes to how animals should be treated. Um, and so when you look online, for example, you will see some things about different animal interest groups. You'll see different news articles about animal welfare. But it's important to make a distinction between animal welfare and animal rights. So in its most extreme form, animal rights or people who subscribe to animal rights or have the animal rights viewpoint do not believe that animals should be used for any purpose at all. Whereas animal welfare is only looking at how is that animal coping in its environment? What is the animal's quality of life? So it's important to keep these two things in mind because there's a lot of confusion when it comes to animal welfare. And I think that's part of the reason why it can be such a polarizing topic because people don't necessarily understand exactly what animal welfare means. And so animal welfare has an impact on other areas and it's influenced by other areas. So if we look at this diagram here, Animal welfare can be influenced by the animal's environment, the genetic background of the animal, what the animal is being fed, as well as its behavior. Um, and then on the other hand, as I just mentioned, animal welfare is influenced by legislation and in turn can influence legislation. So people's views about animal welfare can cause changes leading to laws being passed that are then implemented on the farm or that have to be implemented by people raising the animals. Economics is another factor where there's kind of this two-way street between animal welfare and economics. Um, and then we also have product quality and food safety, where uh, especially if an animal is diseased, 
that's going to impact food safety. And when an animal is diseased, its welfare is poor. And so the quality of the product is not as good and food safety is impacted. And then public perception already kind of touched upon uh, saying that that can influence an animal's welfare and how people see animals being treated kind of has a feedback mechanism on what they think about animal welfare and how they view animal welfare. All right. Okay. So when we're thinking about animal welfare, it's useful to have a framework in mind. And this is called the three circles model or the three overlapping approaches of describing what animal welfare is. So people's concerns about animal welfare kind of fall into three main categories. The first, affective states, means feelings or emotions of the animals. Um, then there's basic health and biological functioning. So this deals with disease. And then natural living, this deals with animal behavior. So when people are concerned about animal welfare, usually the concern they have can fall under one of these three, but they're not mutually exclusive. There is some overlap. So when we're talking about disease, for example, that falls within this sphere, but it also overlaps with affective state because animals that are diseased have feelings of disease. They're not feeling well. And perhaps the most famous way to think about animal welfare is in terms of the five freedoms. So I'm sure most of you have heard a lot about the five freedoms. So this originated in the UK in the 60s and 70s. And it's a pretty useful way of thinking about animal welfare. A lot of certification programs such as um, Humane Farm Animal Care or uh, Humane Certified. So if you see that label on your Thanksgiving turkey that says Humane Certified, a lot of those companies, when they go and do audits on farms to see what the level of welfare is, a lot of them will have the five freedoms or some version of the five freedoms as part of their auditing. Um, so these five freedoms are going to be incorporated throughout my presentation as I move into talking about some of the animal welfare considerations for backyard poultry. Um, so in terms of uh, actual definition of animal welfare, the one that's used in the scientific community is this one by Dr. Donald Broom. And he said that animal welfare is the state of an animal regarding its attempts to cope with its environment. So by coping, we mean, is that animal able to use its behavior or physiology or other mechanisms to adjust to changes in its environment? If the animal cannot adjust to these changes or, or challenges, its welfare will be negatively affected. And then the American Veterinary Medical Association has a similar definition for animal welfare. It's pretty long. But basically here, it also touches on this idea of coping. Can the animal cope? And then here you can see that the five freedoms are woven throughout here. So pain, fear, and distress, behavior, um, and then it talks about disease prevention and so on. So this is what we mean by animal welfare. And again, this is very different from animal rights. They are related because they concern views, people's views about how animals should be treated, but they're not exactly the same. Okay, so I want to try something. So this is called Poll Everywhere, and I'm very interested in knowing, in your opinion, what you think the main welfare concern is for backyard poultry flocks. And so this is completely anonymous. I have no way of tracking who said what. Um, I often use this in my classes when I'm teaching to give the students an excuse to check their phones because they're going to check their phones anyway. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, um, you can text, this is my first name, I'm part of my last name, and 667. If you text that to this number, then you should be able to just type in your answer. And so um, at the end, we will be able to see everybody's responses. But again, we have no way of, of seeing who said what. Okay. All right, so we have quite a few different ones here. So nutrition, housing, um, feather pecking, free range, um, housing as well, another one, and then regulations. 
Um, that's another good one because regulations are so variable too when it comes to backyard poultry. I don't even have a handle on those. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Um, that's good to know. Um, so in the next part of the presentation, uh, these are the main welfare considerations that I'll be focusing on today. And so I just wanted to see how your animal welfare concerns kind of fit in with what I was planning to talk about today. Um, so I'm gonna start talking about behavior and then housing systems, diet and nutrition, uh, followed by health and disease. And then there are some other animal welfare considerations too that I will touch on. Um, so for our poultry species, they're social species. They establish a dominance hierarchy or pecking order. They do this through aggressive behavior such as threats, pecks and fights. But once they have established the hierarchy, the group is usually stable unless there's some change to the group. So for example, adding new birds to the group. Um, so when new birds are being added, it's really important to first quarantine them for a period of time to make sure they're not bringing in disease. And I'll touch on that more later but also have them either beside the flock um, with some fencing so that they can see each other and then have them grow to a body size where they're, they're large enough that they can participate in the establishment of this dominance hierarchies. And it's also important not to just introduce one bird um, because that one bird is likely to be picked on by the, the flock, the other flock that you're trying to introduce the bird into. So along with this social behavior, we have some behavioral problems. And these are welfare concerns for the birds, but they can be concerns for human safety as well, especially when we're talking about aggression. So we usually see this with roosters. Sorry, I'm just fighting off a bit of a cold here. Um, so with aggression, um, we see this between birds, also can be directed for, by birds to people. Um, and then feather pecking and cannibalism, these two are behavioral problems that are not related to aggression. So these are abnormal behaviors. We usually see them more in uh, poultry when they're housed in groups of 20 or more. We don't see it as much in smaller flocks, um, but it is a problem. It, feather pecking can result in these kind of bald spots. And these birds have more trouble staying warm in the winter. Uh, they will eat more feed too, to try and maintain their body heat. And sometimes if the pecking draws blood, this can lead to cannibalism. And so in the literature, feather pecking has actually been cited as the major behavioral problem in backyard flocks. Um, so some behaviors that are important for the birds are things like preening, dust bathing, and roosting. So I'll be going over these. So our waterfowl and our land birds preen a little bit differently. Waterfowl use water to, to keep their eyes and nostrils clean, but the main purpose of preening is to keep the feathers in good condition. And so it's important that the birds are housed in clean conditions to keep their feathers clean and to also prevent disease from spreading and so on. Um, so with dust bathing, this acts like a type of dry shampoo if you want to think about it that way. So with these chickens here, you can see that they're Getting that grit and dust up into their feathers, it helps dislodge pests and helps them to maintain their feather condition. So like with preening, uh, it maintains that feather condition, which helps to protect the bird's body and insulate their, their body and keep their temperature at the right level. Um, but with dust bathing, the birds do have a preference for certain types of substrates to dust bathe in. And uh, chickens and turkeys will preferentially dust bathe in loose kind of sandy substrates or peat moss, um, which of course is not always practical to give them that when we're housing them in backyard flocks. Um, and then chickens and turkeys will dust bathe about every two to three days or so. And so this is here you can see why there's this move to cage-free systems in our commercial egg industry is because these birds are so motivated to dust bathe. Foraging or feeding and drinking behavior, of course, important maintenance behaviors as well. And part of that is foraging behavior. Um, so I'm just going to show you a quick little YouTube video here. Um, so with these birds, you can see that they're kicking up dirt here in this 
um, woody area and that's to expose insects that they can eat and chickens will spend quite a lot of time foraging so if they have an area where they can forage they if they spend more time doing that that means they're spending less time doing other negative behaviors such as feather pecking um, so foraging is part of the feeding behavior and it's part of the housing could be part of the housing system as well when it comes to nesting this is something that's really important for our egg laying chickens they do prefer a very secluded nesting area to lay their egg and they will show signs of frustration if they cannot find a nest to lay in. So again, you can see why there's this move away from housing chickens in cages where they don't have an appropriate nesting area. Um, the type of substrate that the egg is laid on is also important. So hens prefer something that they can manipulate with their beaks. But of course, again, that's not always practical in the types of systems that we house them in um, because it's harder to clean. Uh, we recently did just a small research project here where we were looking at whether hens preferred to lay their egg on astroturf, um, like a plastic coating on the wire, or just a bare wire nest floor. And the majority of chickens did prefer to lay on the astroturf. Um, that's just what we found in our study in a cage free system. But um, other studies with hens in cages have, have also found similar results. And then perching or roosting is something that uh, is kind of left over from, if you want to think about the wild ancestors. So this behavior is still with our domestic breeds of birds. They do want to roost at night. Part of that is evolutionarily, it helps birds, it helps protect them from ground predators. And it also, in our, our systems that we house them in, helps them get away from those other birds that might be trying to peck them or birds that are aggressive. And this is, again, another behavior that birds are very motivated to perform. It's not something that's very, um, I don't wanna say necessary, but for our big turkeys, they can't re really perch very well. And um, so we don't tend to give you know, our huge commercial turkeys access to perches, but at least for chickens and smaller birds, perches are important. So these are called behavioral needs, nesting, dust bathing, and perching, because research has shown that birds will show signs of frustration if they're prevented from performing these behaviors. Um, so I just want to stop here for a moment and just see if there are any questions from anyone. No, no questions at this time. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, if you have questions at any time, please just post them in the Q&A and I'll try to remember to get to them. Um, all right. Um, so next I'm going to talk more about different types of housing systems for our backyard poultry flocks. So just as we have many different breeds of chickens, turkeys and ducks that people can choose to keep, there are many, many different types of housing systems. They're very variable. I think somebody mentioned that in, in the poll that we had a little bit earlier. And so some systems have are completely enclosed, others are open to the air here. You get these hoop structures, pre-made structures, um, you get you know, homemade structures. Some people have kind of designer coops that they like to have in their backyard. But the housing system is very important for providing protection from predators and also the weather. It's important because it, it meets that behavior or the, the maintenance need for feed and water. So it provides the birds with feed and water and meets their behavioral need. So some things to consider with housing, especially are things like crowding. There should be, for chickens, there's more information available, but it's suggested that you have a minimum of about one and a half to two feet per bird. Um, you need to have enough waterers and feeders available for the number of animals in that area. Um, feed and water should be easily accessible as well. All right, so that was housing. Um, so next I'm gonna move on to diet and nutrition. And I just touched on feeders and waterers, um, but when we're thinking about feed, it's important to provide high quality feed. 
So even though these birds do in many cases have access to bugs and other vegetation in the backyard, it's important to give them another high quality feed and there's many different types that are commercially available and this is to meet their nutrient requirements. And it's recommended to buy feed about every two months or so to make sure that it's fresh and you want to check it for mold and rancidity. And when storing feed, you should avoid storing it in direct sunlight where it's, or anywhere where it's exposed to heat, moisture, or rodents. Um, and so this chicken down here, <laughs> you can see is quite a large chicken. And so something else to consider is it's tempting to give them many treats, mealworms and things like that, but it can go too far. And um, our chickens definitely don't need to be eating our yesterday's leftover veggie pizza. Um, they don't really need the carbs. And if they do get obese, that can lead to health problems as well. So water is arguably even more important than feed um, because it's, it's used in many different biological functions, so for thermoregulation. So when the temperature outside goes up, increases, then water intake increases. So these birds really need to have access to fresh, clean water. Um, water is important for digestion, growth and reproduction, it lubricates the joints, maintains the blood pressure, and it's also used to get, eliminate waste. And so what we don't want is to have these open sources of water that birds can stand in and bathe in and you can get all kinds of dirt and germs in there. Um, it's better to have a source of water that's closed at the top so it can stay relatively clean. Um, if you do provide open water sources, then these will need to be checked more often to make sure that they're clean and fresh. And then in the winter time, it's especially important to make sure that whatever water is provided doesn't freeze because the birds do need to have continuous access to fresh, clean water. Okay, um, so with that, I'll move on to health and disease. So there's quite a few. We do have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, with regards to the housing, BG asks, what do you think the best housing system is depending on the bird? Um, that's a hard one yeah so does that mean depending on the, the species so chickens turkeys or ducks um, I imagine that would play a role yeah so there's so many different types of systems coops and things like that um, I don't know if, if your question is referring more to like free range I don't know if you can maybe give some clarification or just a little bit more detail on that question. While we're waiting for him to or him or her to come in, somebody pointed out that chickens cannot digest or handle high fiber foods. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition to not feeding them pizza, what else is a no no? Um, so some things like avocados, um, tomato plants, those are bad as well. Um, Bread. Yeah, I don't know if, Jackie, you might know more about this um, than I do. Um, other than the avocado from from the home flock, I mean, the, yeah, um, there's a, they can eat a lot. of. If we can eat it, they can eat it except for avocados. <laughs> It's interesting because in the UK, it's actually illegal to feed them chicken scraps um, because people don't, or I mean, the government doesn't want people feeding them like meat and things like that. Uh, so here, it's it's not as regulated. But yeah. they have to be very careful when feeding scraps because uh, it can go bad and you can end up with botulism. Mm -hmm. um, Somebody asked, uh, Maria asked, we're thinking about adding birds to our friend's flock. How do you introduce the birds? Yeah, so that is a really good question. Um, so probably the easiest thing to do is, well, first to quarantine them for at least four weeks to make sure they're not carrying any kind of disease that you're bringing into your flock. But then if it's possible, have them in an area right beside your flock, um, separated by a fence that they can see each other through and 
keep them there for a few weeks so they kind of get used to each other. Um, and then I've, I've seen people suggesting that if you put them in with the new flock at night, they all kind of wake up together in the morning. Um, that might be something to try as well. Um, so that then the new birds have been there overnight and then the next morning they kind of wake up and oh there's some new birds here and hopefully that helps reduce some of the fighting and aggression but again because they are social species they will still be establishing that dominance hierarchy. Um, BG uh, clarified said he was wondering if you had any housing systems you prefer. I think that's probably free range versus confined versus um, whatever. Yeah, so that that's a very interesting question. Um, with free range is a nice idea, but a lot of it depends on how it's managed. A lot of it comes down to management. You can have animals in a confined system, in a barn, indoors, and if it's managed really well, their welfare will be good. Um, then you can have animals that have access to a free range area, but the potholes through which they access that area are too small, so they can't really use it, or there's no vegetation or cover for them once they're out on the range. So then you have birds that are afraid to go outside and use that area um, because they have nowhere to hide if there are hawks and things flying overhead. Um, so what, in terms of what I prefer, ideally it would be great to have a system where you know these birds have outdoor access and they're protected, but again, it just depends on management. And if someone's gonna manage a bird better in a confined system than in a free range system, then I would say the confined system is better in that case. It, it would depend a lot on the number of birds that you had as well. And um, backyard flocks, in most states, it's illegal to have your birds go on somebody else's property. So if you don't confine them somehow, uh, you can't have them go on to somebody else's property by law. Mm -hmm. So um, confinement is thing. And most of our places have predator problems. So having a good confined, like some of the pictures that you showed are, are e essential to prevent um, predator problems. Um, anonymous viewer asks, how big would a free range kind of cage be? So that varies to, again, depending on how many birds someone wants to produce or have. Um, it can be the size of, you know, our barns where we have commercial turkeys, where we have maybe up to 10,000 birds in that barn, and then they have access to the outdoor area, which um, they would need a certain amount of space per bird. And I don't want to make it up, so I'm not going to, um, take a guess, but if you look at, if you Google um, the standards for Global Animal Partnership or Humane Certified, they actually have numbers that they use when they go and audit farms for free range, and they have um, a prescribed amount of space that those producers have to give their birds. So I can make a note of that and email you that information if, if you're interested. Um, I will have my email at the end of this presentation if you want to send me your, your question and I can get you some more numbers on that. It also depends on the nature of the free range area. If you're going to be in a bunch of mud or um, mm -hmm. it, pa or have lots of pasture material too it makes a big difference so okay i think that's it okay um all right so moving on to health and disease so good health is a requirement for good health care. if an animal is diseased its welfare is necessarily going to be poorer than if there was no injury or disease and so some of the effects of disease on animal welfare include things like pain uh, either from inflammation or if there are sores and lesions associated, uh, weight loss, dehydration. So here you can see those five freedoms coming into play. Uh, animals that are sick are more stressed, are more susceptible to getting other diseases. And sickness behavior. Um, sickness behavior is actually evolutionarily adaptive. It helps animals get better faster because they are resting more. 
Um, so there is a kind of a function for sickness behavior, but it's associated with these negative feelings. And so here you can see where freedom from pain and disease and those kind of things, the five freedoms, really come into play here. So some general indicators just for recognizing pain in birds. So if there's something that's causing pain at that moment, an acute type of pain, um, typically birds will vocalize, they'll show escape reactions, they might move their head a lot more than normal and have increased head movements, excessive movements, as well as increased heart rate, and you'll see them breathing a lot faster than normal. If the pain is more of a chronic nature, um, the birds will have kind of a, a down, crouched position, closed eyes, their heads drawn into their body. They're not very active. They don't perch as much. And if they have a particular limb or area of their body that's injured, they'll avoid using that limb and have more of a protective behavior toward the area that's injured. So as with um, recognizing signs of pain, we can also recognize signs of sickness in birds. Sorry, it's skipping around on me. But first, for both of these, being able to recognize pain and sickness behavior, it's really important to know your flock. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to know every single bird in your flock and what that bird looks like, but just general, what are the behavioral patterns? What kind of activity patterns do these birds have? And um, you know, what do they look like? Normally, are they alert? Um, like in this picture here, healthy animals are alert. They're kind of sitting upright. They have clean feathers. They're grooming themselves. Whereas in this picture, you can see that this bird just kind of looks more disheveled and, and dirty. And so with sickness behavior, we see a drop in activity level. Uh, the animals are not as social. They're not grooming themselves as much, which is why we see this dirty kind of ruffled appearance. And they're not eating and drinking as much. And so usually the eating and drinking is what people will notice first or a drop in production. They're not producing eggs. They're not growing. Um, we see an increase in huddling and shivering behavior, especially with diseases that cause fever and then increased resting and sleeping behavior. So these are just some practical kind of signs that people can use to identify animals that are sick. The um, question is, what are some common diseases in backyard flocks? Um, I think that's more of a question for an independent webinar <laughs> on different common diseases. Um, because there are a lot of diseases that can affect backyard flocks. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that or just... Um, I will comment on a couple. Um, so I will get to that in, I think, the next slide or the one after that. Okay. So, yeah, I'm not a, a chicken veterinarian, but there, there are a few common diseases um, that I can mention. So for health problems, the most common ones in backyard flocks that in the literature that's been done, research that's been done, most commonly there's problems with mites and lice. Um, so you can see here, this chicken is full of mites. And um, so lice and mites can cause drop in weight. Um, the, the birds aren't drinking, they're not producing. And with lice, especially if they're, or any kind of parasite that's sucking blood, these, this can lead to death in severe cases. Um, so our external parasites are a huge issue in backyard poultry flocks. Other things that are a problem are classified as others. So things like injuries, um, diarrhea, and um, something else that's a huge issue in backyard flocks is Marek's disease. So this is a viral disease that causes tumors um, and there is a vaccination available against Marek's disease. And so this would be the most common viral disease. But then of course we do get problems with avian flu. Um, we had this in Indiana last year. There was a problem with avian flu. And a lot of times people will do like to blame backyard flocks because they have more potential for contact with wild birds that carry these diseases. Other diseases that we see in backyard flocks are bacterial diseases like seminolosis or um, coli bacillosis caused by E. coli bacteria. And, and these are the two bacteria that can cause diarrhea. Um, so hopefully that kind of answered part of that question. There are quite a number of other diseases as well.
So when it comes to controlling and preventing health problems, um, as I mentioned, vaccination is one option for some types of diseases. Uh, treatment is possible as well. So for salmonella and E. coli, there are some types of back, uh, antibiotics available that can be used to treat the disease. Um, there are pesticides against mites and lice. But most important is hygiene and biosecurity. So you always hear this prevention is better than cure. Um, and that really is true. And that's why whenever we talk about backyard flocks, we always hear about biosecurity. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about biosecurity. And then I do wanna talk about euthanasia because this is a really important animal welfare consideration. And it's not a topic that people really wanna talk about, but anyone who's considering having backyard poultry or any kind of pet really, um, euthanasia is something that will come up inevitably. Um, and so that's, it's really important from an animal welfare perspective. Okay, so when it comes to biosecurity, um, things that are important are to just clean and disinfect the equipment on a regular basis and make sure that rodents and other wild animals cannot get into where those birds are housed. It's also important to keep wild bird feeders away. So keep them in a different, if you are interested in, in feeding wild birds, make sure that the feeders are located very far away from where your backyard flock is going to be. Um, that way you reduce the risk of disease being transmitted to your flock. And then I mentioned about quarantining new birds. That is really important. Um, so at least four weeks of quarantine before they are introduced into the new flock. And then washing your hands before and after handling the birds. Um, something that's really effective is having dedicated clothing and footwear. So clothes and footwear that you wear only when you go to see your birds. Um, and when you have new birds that are in quarantine, don't wear the same footwear there or the same clothes unless you've disinfected and washed those items of clothing um, because you don't wanna contaminate the two different areas. Um, a lot of people do wanna show visitors their, their backyard flocks, but from biosecurity standpoint, having no visitors coming into the location where your flock is, is best um, because people do carry disease or they have the potential to bring disease in on their clothing and their shoes. You don't know, you know, if they walked to the pond the day before and they stepped in some goose poop and, and now they're bringing something into your flock unknowingly. Um, something else that's important is the litter. So if birds are given straw or sawdust, this should be kept clean. So if it's sticking to your feet, it's sticking to their feet too. And um, when it's dirty inside the coop, um, it attracts flies and flies also bring pests with them. We have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, if a chicken has a disease and we eat it, will, it, will we get it also? That's a good question. Um, so that depends on the disease. So if it's something like salmonella, um, if you know, on an egg, for example, if the egg's not washed properly and it's not cooked to the right temperature, then there is the possibility of people eating the eggs, getting salmonella. Uh, something like avian flu, we don't get that from eating the meat of infected birds, but um, in China, the most recent strain of avian flu, um, they did show that it was transmitted to people, but not from eating the product. Um, so there are diseases that are transferred through, you know, the air or contact with infected animals. And then you get some diseases that are transmitted by eating infected products. So it, in connection with that, somebody wants to know if a sick chicken lays an egg and we eat the egg, will we get the disease? Um, so again, if you cook the egg to the correct internal temperature and if... Um, you kind of clean the egg beforehand, uh, depending on what the disease is. No, I can't think of anything right now um, where you will definitely get the disease. I'm trying to remember if there are any diseases in eggs that are not killed by cooking. Yeah, but most of the diseases that make chickens sick don't affect people. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get that disease because it's a chicken disease. 
in many cases. Mm -hmm. But yeah, cooking it will definitely kill it. Um, somebody would our friends have some rats around their chicken coop. Is that a problem? Yes. Yeah, I would say they should try to get rid of those rats. Um, they can get into the feed or they will try to get into the feed and um, rats just bring all kinds of germs with them. So a good idea to try and get rid of those. Especially salmonella. Mm -hmm. Jackie, I'm going to jump in real quick. Just uh, you guys continue the conversation. I, we didn't get a chance to launch. We've got a couple of polls I want to make sure I launch. So I'm going to launch the first of those polls now. And you guys, I'll leave it up for about a minute and I ask our attendees to uh, answer those questions. But uh, that poll is launched now. So you guys continue the conversation. Thanks, Mark. I completely forgot about that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so I just want to move on to euthanasia. As I mentioned, this is a really important animal welfare consideration. And of course, people don't like talking about it. But um, it actually means good death by definition. That's what euthanasia is. And so it's the most rapid, painless, and distress-free death possible. And so what this means is loss of consciousness should be rapid. And then loss of consciousness should be irreversible. So meaning that the animal should not gain consciousness after the method has been applied. And so this is information that's in the American Veterinary Medical Association's guide on euthanasia methods. So this is the main guide that people use when they're looking to what is the best method of euthanasia for different types of animal species. Um, and so some, some things to think about in terms of euthanasia are, okay, when do we know if an animal should be euthanized? Well, this depends on, is the animal experiencing pain or distress? Can the animal get access to feed and water? Because if it can't, it's gonna either, it's gonna starve and get dehydrated. Um, how likely is it that the animal will recover from illness and injury? And then can the bird be treated? Uh, what is the possibility of that animal transmitting disease to other animals? And so with these recent avian influenza outbreaks, they've chosen to cull um, or kill the birds to prevent the disease from spreading to others because it's a really, really nasty disease that really has a, a significant impact on the birds. And it, it actually, if it's the high, highly pathogenic avian flu, it actually kills the birds. Um, so euthanasia of infected flocks is a better alternative than having other flocks being infected with the virus. And then economics, people don't like to think that economics matter, but it does. So if it's more expensive to treat, if it's too expensive to treat an animal, and if someone's not going to treat an animal because of the cost of treatment, it's better to euthanize that animal. Okay, so some other considerations along with that are training. So people who will be performing the euthanasia need to be properly trained to do this um, because they need to be able to make decisions about when an animal should be euthanized and what is the best method to use. And so part of these decisions also depend on people's ethical views. So again, you can see why this is such, such a polarizing topic. And then some euthanasia methods have risks to human safety as well. And so that's why training is so important. And then people need to recognize signs of pain and distress, as I mentioned, to know whether an animal should be euthanized. And then they also need to be able to say, okay, that animal is unconscious and it's not going to gain, regain consciousness. So that's something else that's important to be able to recognize when a euthanasia method is applied. Um, so you can click on this link when uh, later if you want to look at this presentation. Um, all the methods for euthanizing poultry are listed in the AVMA's euthanasia guide. And so the acceptable methods are things like barbiturates and anesthetics, which can only be administered by people who are registered by the, with the DEA, so veterinarians essentially. But there are other methods that they call conditionally acceptable. And these methods are acceptable if certain conditions are met. So things like gases, these gases need to be pure. Um, they can't be mixed with uh, other types of things. Decapitation is something that's conditionally acceptable. Um, electrocution, if it's done right. And then gunshot for free range birds and birds that are not housed in confined environments. 
And something else that is actually used quite often is cervical dislocation. Um, so that's where the vertebrae and the neck are separated. And so this can be done by hand or using some type of tool, but it's really important that the tool is not used to crush the neck. It really needs to separate the vertebrae. And then there are some other, other we call these physical methods. So another one is blunt force trauma. Um, basically that is hitting a bird over the head. It's really effective when it's done properly. And this is used for birds that are too big to kill using cervical dislocation. And then there are these purpose built captive bolt pistols that you can get. Um, they're commercially available. And this is where the human safety aspect comes in um, because people who are not trained to use these methods can injure themselves or others. But this is another method that's very effective if it's done properly. All right, um, so I'm just gonna, I see I only have a few minutes left. So I'm just gonna end with talking about some other animal welfare considerations for our backyard flocks. And these are mainly dealing with uh, pets and, um, predators and so you'll see a lot of these types of youtube videos people think it's kind of funny their dogs chasing their chicken or their duck around the backyard but if you think about it from the duck's perspective it's causing fear it can cause pain if the dog grabs a hold of that bird so it's really not funny um, it is affecting the welfare of that bird and so this is a problem for some people if they have pets and they have backyard flocks as well um, so with dogs, we can train our dogs uh, to stay away from the birds, but more <laughs> practical or easier is to just keep the birds in an enclosed area where cats and dogs cannot gain access to them. And this is the same for the different types of predators that we see in, in cities as well as rural areas. Um, so possums, skunks, raccoons, even hawks um, will try to get a hold of chickens if they can. And so having these birds in an area that will protect them from predators is really important in terms of their welfare. Can the stress of a pet chasing the bird shorten its life? Um, if it's chronic, so if it happens a lot, then I would say yes. Um, I don't know that there's actually any scientific data to support that, um, but any kind of, I don't know that anyone's going to fund a research project to see how long a chicken lives if you have a dog chasing it. Um, but any time when you have a dog that's always chasing a chicken and that happens over a prolonged period of time, that bird will have reduced disease resistance um, and probably lose weight and things like that because it's just more active. And the, one other question is, where would you suggest gaining training on euthanasia for someone who has a handful of chickens in their backyard? Yeah, so that's a hard one um, because it's not always very accessible. So usually I would say if you have a county extension office, that might be something they can help with. Um, it's definitely something that I can try to help with as well. I don't know where you're located, but I'd be happy to send you information on that. Um, and then some other companies have produced some training videos on, on euthanasia as well. So I uh, might be happy to provide some of those resources. We might have to do a webinar on it. Yeah, it's another big topic that will take a lot of time to get through. Yeah. We have about three minutes left if anybody, oh, you still have more, sorry. Oh, uh, no, this, was, this is just the conclusion. So um, I hope through this presentation, I've kind of been able to share with you some of the major animal welfare considerations. And I hope that you have a, a good understanding of animal welfare and Especially if you think about the five freedoms and the different areas of animal welfare and think about how these considerations fall in with these areas, then um, you can hopefully think about some ways to improve welfare of backyard poultry. Uh, thank you. We got one final poll we're going to launch. I'm going to launch it now. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, attendees, just sort of give us some feedback on the presentation you, you just saw. Yeah, thank you. That would be very much appreciated. Um, and if there are any more questions in these last couple minutes, I'd be happy to answer those as well. I would also like to indicate some of the upcoming webinars. Uh, April 11th, for those involved in 4-H, 
uh, animal projects. We have a webinar on the essential elements for a successful 4-H chick chain pro project. Uh, Dr. Bridget McRae, um, who's now at Auburn University, will be discussing that. Uh, if you want to join us, it's on April 11th. Um, and if you have any ideas for topics, please uh, type them in the box. Uh, I think we already have a couple with pest control and euthanasia. Um, it's my job to organize the webinars, so if you have any uh, ideas, let us know. Do we have any last-minute questions? No, I don't see any last minute. Oh, we do. What is the appropriate square foot per bird for a meat chicken pen? Um, so in general, it's about um, what I read. It's about one and a half to two square feet per bird. I don't know that that's specific to meat chickens. Um, so again, I would have to look that up for you. Um, I don't know if you know Jackie. Uh, it depends. It's usually on a per pound basis, not on a per bird basis. Um, and I'm not sure on the numbers per um, per pound, but it would be on um, some of the extension sites. Um, yeah, because yeah, it depends how big they are. Yeah, I mean, the, a meat chicken can you know if you raise it to three weeks versus if you raise it to six or eight weeks you're going to uh, get a larger uh, space requirement uh, one last question was what are the five freedoms um, so the five freedoms are um, I guess I can if I have it here on my I can just kind of go over them briefly. Um, so in, 19, in the 1960s, a lady named Ruth Harrison published a book. Um, and in that book, it really portrayed farm animal production very negatively. And so people were very concerned with um, how animals were produced. And so the uh, government in the UK um, actually set up a commission to investigate how farm animals were actually being produced. And um, so they came up with these five freedoms. And they basically were saying, OK, for a bird to have a good level of welfare, it should not be hungry and thirsty. It should not have discomfort. It should not have pain, injury, and disease. It should be able to have express its normal behavior. It should not have fear and distress. And so these are the five things that they thought were most important from an animal welfare perspective. And so they're called the five freedoms. Um, so I hope that answered your question. But this is basically the most um, well-known thing that people first think about when they think about what animal welfare is. Right. And uh, we are up on our time. It's uh, after 4 o'clock. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Erasmus. You did a great job. Um, I hope people found it useful. Uh, as we said, it was recorded, so if you want to go back and review anything that you might have missed, feel free to do that. It should be up in a couple of days uh, at the LEARN site that you accessed in order to get in here in the first place. I did put on a link to our Facebook page, and I will make the announcement when the recording is available if you go to that one. And the past recordings are available at the extension.org slash poultry site. I put a link to that in the chat box. So thank you very much for attending and hope we will see you next month. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.